As we share our knowledge today and every day at this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. So with the implementation of a new strategic plan at UOW, our university is undergoing some long-term changes with the goal of being ranked in the top 1% of universities internationally. Today is your chance to find out what that means for you and to communicate with our senior executive of the university on a whole range of important issues. So answering your questions today will be Professor Paul Wellings, our Vice-Chancellor. Paul Wellings assumed the post of Vice-Chancellor of the University of Wollongong in January 2012 and was appointed Commander of the British Empire in the 2012 Queen's Birthday Honours List for services to higher education. Thanks for being with us today, Paul. We also have Professor John Patterson, who is our Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Uh, he's primarily responsible for advising, monitoring and reviewing our faculty operations. His portfolio focuses on strategic directions, human resource planning and financial allocation in the academic sector of the university. Thanks, John. We also have Professor Ava Lenonen, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Education. Uh, Ava's role in, entails coordinating the development of academic plans and maintaining the currency of academic policy. She is also responsible for the Academic Services Division, which provides educational, academic staff development and learning support functions. Thanks for coming today, Ava. We also have Mr. Damien Israel, who is our Chief Financial Officer. Um, Damien's primary responsibility is the management of university's resources. His portfolio includes the divisions of Financial Services and Information Technology Services, and the Legal Services and Print and, Division, uh, and, Print and Distribution Services Units. Thanks again for coming today, Damien. And on my right, we have Ms. Melba Crouch, who is our Chief Administrative Officer. Uh, she is responsible for the management of administrative affairs of the university. She's responsible for the leadership and oversight of a number of units and divisions, including, but not limited to, the Academic Registrar's Division, Accommodation Services, and Executive Chair of the Uni Centre Board. Thank you, Melba. And last but not least, we have Ms. Megan Huseman who is our academic registrar. Uh, Megan's areas of responsibility include uh, student administration, student fees, examinations, graduation, policy coordination, central committee support and elections. So thanks for coming today, Megan. Uh, before we get to your questions, I'd just like to now invite our Vice-Chancellor, Paul Wellings, to give us a brief overview of the new strategic plan for UOW. Thanks, Paul. Thank, thanks, Stephanie. And, um, I'm, I'm going to do this very briefly because I suspect there are, there are more questions and it would be interesting to get to the questions rather than for me to sort of dwell on a, on a document. But there is, there is a strategic plan and it's, it's available on the, on the web so you'll be able to download it there for those of you who are interested. And it's the sort of document that every big organisation uh, produces because it, it sort of uh, gives an indication of how we are going to use our resources and what the scale of the ambition is of the of the university and our our ambition is uh, is uh, pretty great actually i think we're looking to move our, our overall ranking from being in the top two percent to the top one percent of universities in the world as a first approximation there are about twenty thousand universities uh, in the world uh, we want to do that while increasing our research standing and also thinking about the student experience and the teaching environment here and I guess there will be a number of questions uh, around that and then I think we're deeply conscious of the fact that we are a University of the Illawarra and connected here with campuses in Wollongong and then a whole range of campuses that go from Bega through to, to, to Loftus and of course several overseas locations where we've got large numbers of students uh, receiving our degrees and I think the, inter the other interesting thing in the strategic plan is around how do, we, how do we think about making the University of Wollongong um, uh, a destination university and the, the city of Wollongong uh, uh, a university city? So those are very big questions that we most probably can't answer in isolation by ourselves as an institution, but suggest to the work that we do with colleagues around this table that partnerships are really, are really important. And if you, if you open the plan, there's a whole series of goals then around research, teaching, 
the student experience, connecting communities, our international activities, and how do we do that in a sustainable uh, way in, in the broader sense. So that, that's roughly what the plan, the plan is. It's something that we talk to our governing body, the University Council, uh, on a regular basis. And uh, because we've got a series of uh, performance indicators embedded uh, in that process, uh, they inevitably then, let's say, how are we progressing on the plan. The plan itself, Stephanie, as you said, is relatively new, so I think that was uh, approved at the start of 2013, and it's a five-year plan, uh, so it'll carry over, over, this, uh, over this next cycle. That's mostly enough for me, but I think it may be turned to, to questions. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, so we do have a number of pre-submitted questions, so thank you to everyone who's already given us a question. Uh, we'll try and get through as many of those as we can today. If you do think of an amazing question while you're sitting here, um, we do have people wandering around. So we have Sean Liu. Give us a wave, Sean. So Sean will be there to um, take your questions if you think of a good one. So hail him down and we'll try and get to your questions as well. Um, but first, we do have a pre-submitted question for you, Paul Wellings, um, on the topic of the strategic plan. And that is, why do we need to be in the top 1% of universities internationally? I think, I think that's a really uh, in, important question because um, what we've seen in the last decade is the emergence of international uh, league, league tables uh, which evaluate different universities. As I said before, there are about 20,000 universities and I guess as a first approximation, something like, something like 7,000 are sufficiently scaled that, uh, that there's enough information about them. And what's happened is that people have stopped saying uh, are universities about locality domestically or is there an international, is there a, uh, a national ranking? And they've gone to how does the University of Wollongong stand up if we compare it to all the other universities uh, in, in the world? And um, that's important. I think it's important because bureaucrats at national level will allocate money based on perceptions of ranking. Uh, students and staff will want to come to to top uh, universities, and that's that's a, a, an issue uh, for us. And thirdly, the governing bodies of universities will want to make their universities rise up. And we can see in the league tables immediately over the last 10 years the rise of Hong Kong, Singapore, China, Korea. So a whole range of institutions starting at national level to move upwards in these sorts of rankings. Um, we're in the top 2% and my sense is that if we didn't have an ambition here, we would just gr drift gracefully backwards. Not because we're getting worse, but because everybody else is focusing and getting uh, better more rapidly than we are as an institution. So it's that whole thing of if we've got an ambition, how do we convey it in the simplest possible way? And aspiring to be in the top 1% is actually a pretty good vision about where we might want to be as an institution. We now have a question for Megan Huseman um, on the topic of student services. Uh, the question is, where does the money from my SAF funding go every semester? Thanks, Stephanie. Um, that's a really important question too because it's your money and we're really um, proud of with what we've done with it. We um, have allocated the money to over 50 projects across the university. Um, I'll start by talking about the strategic pro programs that we've been running with. Um, there's four strategic program areas and they are um, health and wellbeing and most of you would have already seen the wellbeing centre that's been um, put up on campus and that's been enormously successful. I think it's um, touched over 5,000 students already this year. So in terms of impacting the broader student body, it's actually been very successful. Um, in, in health and wellbeing, we've also put additional money into um, mental health with a, um, a mental health campaign as well. We've also put additional money into counselling both here and at our regional campus, at campuses and disability services as well. The other strategic program area is careers and employability. Um, and your money has put careers consultants into every single faculty at this university. Um, we've also run, um, put in place some online tools for global career searches and increased the um, Innovative program to give you better access to work experience with businesses um, out there in the real world. So the careers employability program has also been highly successful and well received by students. The other strategic program area is um, outdoor space. Um, and most of you will know that we've put in place uh, the Mugger down in the engineering building and that's a, a kiosk and an outdoor recreation space which is paid for completely with your money. Um, we're also working on more strategic space for students, uh, 
around the campus. Um, we've made a commitment to continuing to upgrade student space on this campus with your money, so you'll be seeing more areas upgraded over the next few years. In terms of other projects, we have um, the Global Communicators Project, which is about helping our international students with their English language skills, um, accreditation of um, non-UOW accommodation. So we have a variety of programs, and I don't can't really list all 50 of them here, but we do make sure that um, as many students are as impacted as possible, and we're also helping students who need support the most. Thanks a lot, Megan. And just a follow-up question to that, is the SAF funding likely to be increased in the next years? Okay, so um, the government has approved an increase um, for 2014, but UOW is yet to consider whether it will increase its fees yet. And um, do we know when we will know that answer? Um, probably by November. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so our next question is for Le uh, Ava Lenonen. This is about an academic experience question. Um, it's also related to the change in strategic plan. The question is, will there be changes to the degrees or subjects that are now available to students? Uh, thank you very much. That's an excellent question again. Um, I think I'd like to just start by saying that um, all universities continually need to be looking at the, their course offer, the portfolio, um, what we teach and how we teach. That is the role of universities. So we are constantly horizon scanning for new opportunities, for new innovation. And we are also at the same time looking at whether there are some courses which don't have the demand, uh, the student numbers are, are dropping. In other words, they're no longer popular courses or courses that students want to undertake. And that's courses and majors as well. So the role of universities is to do that, indeed, is to look at the portfolio, refresh it, look at, have some really good criteria about uh, refreshing it and looking at um, particularly about demand and also how we teach uh, courses. There's just a couple of examples what we have also um, reinstated music um, for uh, the new academic year. Photography is on its way. Uh, we're doing business analytics and so on. So there's some new courses that I think will be and uh, our market analysis suggests will be popular and will be in demand. So um, I think it is uh, the job of universities to do that and uh, I think we are doing it very well. I have been concerned that there will be changes to degrees because of the faculty restructure. Could you address that issue? Um, the faculty restructure, as it has happened, has not impacted on, uh, on courses. We are simply doing it as a matter of best practice. That's what universities need to do, is look at their portfolios. So there's no specific examples, to my knowledge, of where the faculty restructure has impacted on course offers. There are some courses that we have stopped offering and it's simply for reasons such as that there might be three or five students who are doing them. One really important point to make here, however, is that we always have a plan for teaching out. In other words, if a student is on a program which we discontinue, we have a plan to ensure that the student is able to continue with the program and get the degree that they signed up to do. Thanks very much. Um, our next question is for Mr. Damien Israel, uh, and it's an IT question. It is, why do we still have the proxy? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, gee, I wish I'd worn my board shorts today, but anyway, here we are. Um, look, we, I think we all recognise that the proxy's seen its day, and uh, it's something that the university is very keen to um, uh, move away from. Um, what we're looking to do in the shorter term is to provide some uh, test uh, areas for some for free wireless access. But uh, in 2014, we've got a project basically to do away with the proxy because we're very much aware of the uh, limitations that the proxy puts on students in terms of their use of uh, smartphones and tablets and the like. So, yeah, definitely um, one of on our radar and uh, something that we recognise needs to be uh, sorted out. Okay, thanks very much. I'm sure that'll make a lot of students very happy. Um, our next question is for Ms. Melba Crouch, our Chief Administrative Officer, and it's to do with parking. The question is, why is nothing being done about the big parking issue within UOW? Right, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I have to say, I'm only in my fourth week in the job, and uh, the number of times people have tackled me about parking has been simply astounding. So I, I, I'm very well aware of the issue. Uh, Parking is, is an integral part of the university's transport strategy. And I guess the bottom line is that we are actually trying to reduce how many cars come onto the campus. 
and there are three imperatives to this. Firstly, it's environmentally responsible to try and minimise uh, the number of people who use cars. Secondly, um, it, it's infrastructure uh, capacity in terms of the roads and, and the access routes into the university that are, are problematic. And third, it's just a matter of sheer economics. Um, so we are trying to reduce the number of car-based trips to and from the campus. We are actively encouraging students and staff to not use cars, to try and use the public transport that, that's available. And we sponsor that quite heavily, and I'll talk about that in a second. And we do want to um, set an example for the local community as well. And I'm sure most of you will be aware that most of the big cities, most of the big towns, are trying to reduce the number of cars that go into their CBDs and for exactly the same reasons as we're trying to do. If we were to increase parking within the campus, that would lead to more pressure on the highway and the surrounding roads in, in the immediate surrounds of the university. Uh, the roads are already congested during peak times to, to a point of uh, a safety concern. We work very closely with Wollongong City Council because they are very concerned about the number of cars we have going through the suburbs um, into the university. And uh, so we do need to look at, at our transport problems coming to and from the university as a holistic issue and not just an issue of parking within, within the boundaries. Um, the other issue is we already have 3,000 parking spaces on the campus. The university has 25,000 students, 16,000 of them commute every day. So you just have to look at the university um, footprint on the map to think about where would we put extra parking and what would we give up for it. And we're trying to look at a 30 to 50 year plan down the, down the pipeline. Do we want to use our land for car parks, which causes problems for the council and the adjoining suburbs and is not environmentally sustainable? Or do we want to think of better ways to put our very scarce resource off the land, teaching facilities, etc. So there's that aspect of it. And the other one that I, as the Chief Administrative Officer and my colleague, the Chief Finance Officer, are very intimately involved in is that each car space would take us about between twenty and thirty thousand dollars to build and then another two to three thousand dollars every year to maintain. You're talking about the lighting and the and the machines and the, the access maintenance, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So parking is not a cheap proposition, especially when we don't want to encourage cars to be coming onto the campus anyway. So that's not a good news answer. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but but that's the sheer mechanics of the issue. Um, someone from the Innovation Campus has asked, when is carpooling going to become available at Innovation Campus for students that carpool from Sydney or the South Coast? Right, the, um, we've just finished on the uh, facilities side doing the 2013 transport survey um, and that will inform uh, reviewing and revising our tra greater transport strategy. Uh, the survey re results gave us some very good information out of the Innovation Campus and one of the recommendations that we're going to be making is to look much more closely at the transport options for innovation and look at how we can actually um, look at carpooling. So I think that's very much in, on the horizon. Within the next couple of years then? I imagine so, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and Mr. John Patterson, I'll bring you in finally, last but not least, we have a question directed at you. Um, how is our marketing message making us a more global university? Yeah, thanks Stephanie, and thanks to my one friend out there who asked that question to, to, to allow me to join the conversation. Thank you very much. The issue is a simple one. The marketing isn't going to take us global, it is going to reinforce an already strong global position. There is absolutely no doubt because of the university's reputation, its diversity, its general activities, that when you consider the global footprint of this university over the time that it has existed, the results that we have achieved are absolutely outstanding. Look around the lawn, look at the diversity of the student body, that's a representation of the global footprint look at where we offer courses, degrees, subjects across the world, there's another manifestation of our global footprint. Look at our achievements on the global stage, 
not the least of which is the most recent, the uh, solar decathlon, where we won. Univers little old University of Wollongong won the worldwide solar decathlon. That is another manifestation of our global footprint in the making. All of those things get picked up. No amount of grounding and no amount of messaging is of any value unless you have a quality product to sell. And we have that. So you get into this virtuous upward spiral of quality product, strong committed approach, aspiration, fully messaged, and you end up with a reputation that is not only deserved, but a reputation which is recognised. So the sign over there that says UOW goes global, it's sort of okay, and it's a good indicator for people as to where the barbecue is, but it's not realistic because we are global, and for your benefit, because it makes your job prospects better, it makes your self-esteem better because you are aware that you've rec graduated from a recognised, globally aware and globally recognised university. For all of those factors and others, we are global and the branding will simply reinforce that message and add to the value of our global footprint. Simple. More than one friend out there. Um, Sean Liu, are you there? Have we had any questions from the audience today? No? Not yet? Okay. Thanks guys, thanks for your interest. Um, please do write down your questions, um, but for the moment I'll go to our pre-submitted questions. Um, we have another one for Paul Wellings. Um, Paul, for UOW to be internationally recognised, do you feel we need to specialise in any particular fields and what would they be? Yeah, I think that's, that's actually a very tough, tough question because um, one, one of the things that we set out to do, given where, where we sit in, in, in Australia and the catchment we've got, is to be um, a full spectrum university, if I, you know, th to use my sort of language on that. So, you know, we, we already teach a very large number of degrees and we do research in a large number of degrees. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on is that our academic community are research active and scholarly active as well as being outstanding teachers. So. The, the idea that somehow that we would become uh, a narrow institution or possibly a monotechnic with just uh, a very small number of uh, outstanding things that we, we focus on, I think is, is not, not a direction that we're going to go in. So the, the thing that we've actually done in the last uh, decade is to say, well, where do we know that we've got really outstanding activities that we want to capitalise on? And you can see... Uh, as you look around this campus and the innovation campus, some major investments in buildings that have got in that are supporting uh, major uh, strengths of the university. So, you know, the, the Australian Institute for Innovative Materials, which is essentially a, a material science laboratory on the innovation campus, most probably in the top uh, 20 facilities in the world of that, of that sort, sort. As you come on to this main campus here, um, the smart facility dealing with infrastructure research and Emory dealing with health and medical uh, research are very distinctive in their own ways. Uh, smart, for example, uh, is, is most probably the largest centre in the world for training PhD students in the space between economics and engineering to do with next generation infrastructure across a whole range of, uh, of areas. Um, the Sustainable Building Research Centre that helps support uh, the student program for the Solar Decathlon is just about finished on the innovation campus and I think we'll have the official opening of that in the first quarter of next year and again is a very distinctive piece of, um, uh, of research amenity which will allow um, the intersection between civil engineering and environmental studies to converge and produce new things and then on this campus uh, behind us we have the, the early start uh, centre, the funding for which we won uh, towards the end of last year, and that's most probably the world's largest social science uh, infrastructure investment, 40 odd million dollars worth of kit going in there to look at how we engage uh, with um, the, the 
period from sort of minus minus nine months to about six years to say how do you build educational strategies uh, for very young children as they go into primary school and how do we engage with parents and their communities to deal with social disadvantage, understanding education. As a first approximation, your life circumstances and my life circumstances were set by the end of our first year at primary school. So that, that one idea, the early start idea, could be transformative, not only for the Illawarra, but actually for children uh, you know, ac across the whole of Australia, if we get that right. So that, that's a very long-winded way of saying that we've got you know, huge strengths in some areas. We've identified systematically over the last 10 years some areas that we've invested in. But one of the things that we're determined not to do is to lose the connection between our teaching excellence and our research excellence because we see that one of the things that um, that makes us stand out here is the intimacy of that and the ease of that relationship between having outstanding researchers and outstanding learning environment uh, moving moving together. And and my view there is is that is is that for all all the folks who graduate from this university, we've got 109,000 alumni now is that we should try and do two things. One is to make sure that people leave with an outstanding degree and, as John said, from a globally recognised university. And then the big challenge for us is not just an outstanding degree, but to make sure that by putting all these things together, people leave with a network for life so that they're able to capitalise on that degree in different ways. Do you think the, uh, the international benchmarks for university success favour those universities that um, do focus in on particular subject areas? No, not, not, not particularly. I think if you, if you look at, I mean, you know, I, I worked in England for 10 years in the university sector there, so there are two outstanding monotechnics, the London School of Economics, which everybody's heard of, and, and the, the London School of Tropical, uh, Tropical Medicine, which fewer people have heard of. Both of those are most probably in their area. In, in the top dozen institutions in the world, but they never appear in the global rankings because the global rankings evaluate a much broader set of things. And that's, that's my point. And we're already a full spectrum university and we need to make sure that where we're being evaluated, it's across that whole breadth rather than being narrow cast into one or two disciplines or one or two research areas. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I now have a question from an international student. Um, which I will direct to you, Ava, uh, and that is, as an international student, what support is being offered for my transition to study in Australia? Um, thank you for, for that question. Um, we obviously um, value uh, our international students a great deal. We have a great diversity on this campus, and uh, we also recognise the fact that being an international student can have additional challenges to being a domestic student. I was an international student once upon a time. I pitched up from uh, Finland to study in England and I still recall how incredibly frightened I actually was of uh, walking up these huge stairs with my reading list in my hand thinking to myself, I haven't read all these books, where am I supposed to go? I hardly spoke any English. Well, my English wasn't uh, as good as it obviously is now, but nevertheless, I, I fully understand and recognize those, um, those challenges that international students have. We obviously have um, Enrollment and Orientation Week, um, which is, have specific activities um, focused on international students, but I also think that it's very important that international students are integrated into the, the student population, so that there are opportunities to constantly interact and network with domestic students. We have also uh, postgraduate mature age um, welcome orientation and that has a particular focus also for international students. And of course we have specific programs which are welcome events and social events and so on for international students. Now we have of course the Good Life series and Wellbeing Centre and so on and they all have people and staff who are able to deal with particular challenges that might present themselves to our international student population. And I also just wanted to mention the Global Communicators Programme, which is an ongoing programme once students are here. 
which is enabling international students and domestic students to come together and through that interaction to learn about each other's cultures but also to improve um, oral communication skills. So there's just some examples there. Maybe just one other quick uh, thing which is not about the um, sort of settling but we also have a, a very good program for helping international students with career development. We have three full-time career advisors focused in particular on working with international students and, and there are, some of these programs are inside the curriculum, some outside the curriculum. But for instance, there's the Going Global series, which is very popular at the moment, um, and helps um, students to start thinking about what happens uh, after graduation and how do I prepare myself for the world of work. So there's just a few examples there, Stephanie. I believe we do have a question live from the audience now. So I'll go to you in the check shirt. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to all the members of the panel for coming out this afternoon. We appreciate your time. Um, my name's Aaron. I'm from the Law, Humanity and Arts faculty. Just a general question that perhaps a few of the members of the panel could answer. You've each spoken about a number of decision-making areas that directly affect students. How have students been included in those decision-making processes and what opportunities exist for students to get involved in the decision-making process? Thank you for that question. Um, Paul, would you like to start? Sure, thanks Megan. Hi Aaron. <laughs> um, so I think um, Aaron's on the student representative forum, he's the undergrad rep for Law, Humanities and Arts, so I'm sure Aaron knows about the student rep forum. But um, So the university has a student representative forum and it's, it's the peak consultative body that the university uses to consult with students. Um, it's a broad student representative forum and it has representatives from WUSA, from the faculties, from Uni Centre, from Senate and a number of other places around, around the university. So that's the top level of the way we consult. In each faculty, there are three student representatives, and each faculty, and that's new this year in terms of being democratically elected student representatives. And each of those student representatives should be taking a place in the key um, faculty committees so that the student voice can be heard at the faculty level as well. Um, in the Uni Centre, where a lot of student life decisions are made, it's also um, that we have a student representative on the Uni Centre board. So at each of the key decision-making points in the university, students are involved in terms of elected positions. And we also have a strong commitment to making sure through each of our strategies with the student voices heard. Um, an example of that is that um, we're currently looking at student service at UOW, and um, Aaron is our student rep on that, on that um, strategy, but we're also putting a lot of effort into the student voice um, beyond representation, so making sure we have a really strong student feedback system, that we have a really strong student survey mechanism, so we have a really broad way of hearing the student voice, both formally through um, democratically elected positions at key decision-making points, but also day-to-day -day in terms of surveys as well. Thanks very much, Megan. I'd also like to throw this question to Ava. Would you like to have a response? Yes, thank you very much. I think Megan more or less answered um, the question uh, very comprehensively, but I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, one of them is that we do have an absolute commitment of hearing the student voice. I worked in a couple of universities, or several universities, before um, um, coming to UOW. Um, and in those universities, I have actually worked with students to articulate, articulate a student voice strategy. So how is it that we hear the student voice, but also um, how is it that we communicate back to students the actions that we have taken jointly in collaboration, in partnership, or as a management team or so on. And I think that's a piece of work that we could focus on a little bit more at UOW, looking at sort of closing the loop. So we have a lot of surveys and feedback and student input, but uh, how do we actually uh, tell you or uh, get some additional feedback from you about what actions have been taken, whether they've been effective, and um, how we move forward if they haven't been particularly effective. I think um, we, we really need to buy into that enhancement culture, which we do, and in continuous improvement culture, and students are an integral part of that. And one very final thing is I chair the University Education Committee. I have student representatives on that committee. And I also uh, am setting up various task and finish group to look up specific, specific issues per, that are relevant to education and students. And the absolute intention is that we will have students on all of those task and finish groups. Thanks very much, Ava. And just to follow up to that, um, do you think um, that most students are aware of these representative bodies? And is that something that the university could communicate perhaps more effectively? Um, my experience uh, from uh, 
the various universities I worked on is that students are not and actually we are not as good at communicating with students and we need to find better, better mechanisms for that. And one mechanism I think we should really explore jointly is uh, how do we use our new learning platform, Moodle, as a mechanism for communicating. And also one of the things that I've, I've noticed is that even though we quite often have good student rep systems, um, the reps don't always hear the voice of students and then they're not able to represent, so we need to look at those sort of issues. So I think if we just uh, articulated a really clear student voice strategy, it would help with all those questions that uh, have been put to us. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Aaron, did that answer your question? Thanks so much for the question from the audience. Not yet? Okay, I'll take another one from our pre-submitted questions. Um, keep thinking of them and hail Sean down if one occurs to you. Um, Melba, this question is for you um, regarding facilities management. And that is, in the future, will the, the green free bus continue to be funded by UOW? And is it something that we can rely on? Right, I think it's important to, uh, to qualify here that there are two completely separate free bus systems um, running it that support the university and, and students. Uh, the first one is uh, so actually provided by the Wollongong City Council or, or the Department of Transport in New South Wales. That provides uh, a run of a, about eight buses a, a, a day normally, or they have, sorry, eight buses on the route, which, which runs every 20 minutes or so. Um, that is a free service provided. Uh, that's the Gong Shuttle. It's interesting to note that only a couple of weeks ago, Transport New South Wales did a complete review of free bus shuttles and cancelled seven of them in New South Wales because of lack of use. And the gong is one of the very, very few that actually survived the uh, Department of Transport's cuts. So they are here for the, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the, the second uh, facility is provided by the university. We run two completely separate routes. We have the North Gong Shuttle and the Gwynville Kiraville Shuttle and they are funded by the university. At this stage there is no intention to trim those. Uh, we are fully aware that they are overly subscribed. Uh, we have been working very closely with uh, with the operator of the uh, Department of Transport provided fleet to try and increase the number of buses that they, they have allocated, but we are certainly not going to reduce the service that we're currently providing. And will you be looking at increasing the number, especially um, regarding the previous question of um, overuse of the car parks? Um, at this stage, our shuttles are well used, but they're not nearly so oversubscribed as the Gong shuttle is. Okay, thanks very much. That's a great question. Um, I now have another question for you, Paul. Um, and that is, again, regarding the changes to the strategic plan. Um, why have all the faculties been condensed into five? And how will this affect my degree? The degree portfolio didn't, didn't change as a result of that. What we've done is, is to try and create an environment where we can move uh, with more flexibility for the future uh, around our, our structures and our cost base on those degrees. And as Ava signalled before, you know, looking at the academic uh, curriculum and the portfolio of activities there and the advent of new technologies, we know that this next decade is going to require us to look uh, almost subject area by subject area the way that we, we deliver those changes and the new faculty structure sets us up to, uh, to do some of that work. Thank you. Uh, there have been concerns um, from students that the faculty restructure was in some way due to cost cutting. Is there any truth to those rumours? No, not, not at all. I think the, the, when, when we set out to do this, we were in a position where the university's budget was uh, in pretty good shape. We could see that, that we could get some efficiencies in different areas and through, through better organisation. So the motive was around actually trying to drive the university into the top 1% in the world and making sure that we had faculties that were using the set of resources and amenities that they had. Interestingly, what's followed on, of course, is that in the middle of uh, this year, um, it, the previous government, government then made the decision to introduce efficiency dividends along with a whole range of other budgetary uh, changes. And so that, that hit us around May 
uh, this year with some very substantial changes uh, in budget and that that of course is then an issue that we have to work through because my sense that irrespective of the change of government that happened at the weekend I think we will inherit still all those pressures that were created through the 2013 budget. So just to be clear, the federal government has reduced the amount of funding available to universities? That's the proposal. It's not gone through legislation and I guess that will go through in early 2014. But but the the there were several things that were, were put in place. One has been parked, which is the the limit to self expenditure on through tax deductions on education that a number of postgraduates used here in the Australian tax system and that's been put that's been pushed back. There was um, uh, 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 an efficiency dividend on all uh, universities that was put in that was quite material, so that I think went to 3.5% uh, as it matured over the cycle. Uh, and that still sits there, but that requires legislation. And then the third area, which uh, has been subject to very little discussion, was the intent to move scholarships for low SES students to income contingent loans. And that's actually a very large sum of money that uh, that moves into the income contingent loan system. And again, I think that's actually automatically gone through. I don't think that bit needed legislation. So that was a very complex thing that came out of the May 13 budget. And um, the sector's still waiting to see what the new government will do. But my sense is, is that um, that they'll uh, trouser all those all those savings, to use the technical expression, and and move on from there. They're not going to put the money back uh, in our direction. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, we also have a question for you, Damien. I'll bring you in again here. It's another um, vaguely IT-related question, <laughs> and that is, what is being done about mobile coverage at the university? Thanks, Stephanie. Um, yes, we know that there's uh, a number of. Uh, weaknesses in the mobile coverage around the place and uh, you know we're uh, having to negotiate that with the carriers it's not something the university controls directly um, in particular we're in negotiations right now with Optus and uh, Vodafone for uh, towers to be uh, placed around the university to improve coverage for those two carriers and at least get them um, towards the levels that Telstra offer us at the moment. Okay thanks very much um, that's a good question. We also have a question for Melva now. Um, it's an environmental question. The question is, what is the university doing to lower our carbon emissions and how are we encouraging more sustainable modes of transport? So you've touched on the transport, but just maybe on the carbon emission part of the question. Uh, certainly, uh, our sustainability, our environmental um, strategy plan is currently under review at the moment. Um, we are taking into account uh, already, based on the, the existing uh, strategy, what our carbon footprint actually is and how we re reduce it in terms of what it is now and how we stop it from growing into the future. Uh, and in fact, I had a meeting this morning with the, the Director of uh, Facilities and, and uh, Professor Paul Cooper from over at the SBRC to talk in general terms about this. So it's, it's something that, that we are very aware of. Um, certainly a big part of the carbon footprint is use of cars and trying to push um, students and staff towards uh, public transport, trains in particular which have a, a, a much lower footprint. Uh, but we, we also have a number of uh, awareness campaigns going on. We're also looking at how we design our buildings and uh, the, the materials we use, the environmental sustainability uh, aspects that we build into the design. And that's a, a very large part of our ongoing carbon uh, footprint management. And um, is UOW's commitment to the environment and reducing carbon emissions an individual goal of the university or based on legislation? I think these days it's always a combination. Um, certainly uh, legislation has its aspect, but I, I think from what I've seen in the last few weeks, there is a very real commitment to going above and beyond what legislation actually requires. And I think that's very much a, the way of the future. If we, if we don't um, think for ourselves and just do what we're told, then, then we, we never actually move on to the next level. So um, we are certainly aiming far above the benchmark that, that government provides us. Fantastic, thanks very much. Uh, do we have any further questions from the floor at this point? Has anyone fallen asleep? Okay, we do have a further question for you, Ava. 
a um, bit of a change of tack, and it comes from uh, a student who is also a parent. Uh, the question is, why are student parents not afforded the opportunity to request consideration with regard to tute times and prac placements to allow for getting to childcare pickups? Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by saying there's no magic wand. This is a question and a challenge that I think all universities have when you are wanting to cater for a very diverse student population. Um, I also like to say that we totally value the fact that mature students and students who are parents want to engage in learning and we are great supporters of lifelong learning and I personally believe that education is one of the only or maybe one of the key mechanisms through which we can actually improve our lives. So total commitment for mature students and parents taking part in learning. But as I said, there is, it's a tough call, absolutely tough call to juggle home and, uh, and learning and other life events. Um, I like to say that um, I think it's unfair to say that we would give no consideration. I think that's a bit of a strong word. Um, I think we will and we do attempt to take students' personal considerations into account. But I think we need to put this into context of the 29,000 students we have in this university, the limited slots for timetabling and uh, resources that uh, all universities have. So within that context, there will be some constraints which are placed on all students um, for uh, lectures and, and tutorials and so on. But I think, as I say, it's unfair to say that we would not try and aim to be flexible uh, where it's possible. And also, I think um, the digital technologies that are, we are embracing increasingly will help us also support learners who are more constrained in terms of time uh, so that we can, uh, uh, we can provide opportunities for learning through the learning, uh, new learning management platform and those will be opportunities that can take place anytime, anywhere. So I think we are looking at ways in which we can support all our students, but I need to say to you that it is a challenge for all universities to cater for such a diverse range of student needs. Thanks very much, Ava. We do have a question from the floor. I'm very excited. It's this lady over here. What's your question? Hi, Ava. Uh, I'm Christy. I'm actually the president of Mature Age Students Network and the WUSA rep for Mature Age Students, and I'm the one who submitted that question. We actually get told unequivocally that childcare is the same consideration, i.e. none, for tute times and that kind of thing. I'm not, no one's asking for specially programmed tute times. We just need to be able to say, hey, my childcare closes at four o'clock, it's in town, so can I have a tute time before th that finishes by 3.30 so I can get there? Um, most of the general student population seem to think that we get that kind of consideration anyway, but we are told unequivocally, no. So there is no consideration happening for us. And we, and we get referred to Kids Uni. Oh, have you tried Kids Uni? They're open longer hours. I was advised yesterday by them that there's a three year waiting list for the under twos room. So, so, Ava, are there avenues for people who have to request special times? I'm actually really glad that you identified yourself, and I'm also glad that you are, uh, did you say, president of a, the Mature Student Society? Because what I failed to say in my answer is that I would like to speak to the mature students and start thinking about ways in which we can start addressing some of the issues that you have. I've been in this university for nine months, so I apologize that I haven't actually managed to make my way to, your, to you or your, your society but I absolutely want to try and to find some solutions and uh, I 100% appreciate how difficult it is. I've been a working mum all my life and had exactly those challenges. Um, so we will look for solutions um, and I think that's the best I can say at this point. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ava, and thank you for your question. Uh, do we have any other questions submitted from the audience at the moment? No? Okay. Questions from seagulls, perhaps? <laughs> um, okay, so I've got another question submitted here for Megan Huseman. 
um, comes from a commuter. As a commuter, what options have the university provided me to become involved in student life? Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I think um, the university has certainly over the last couple of years put a lot more effort and funding into student life at UOW. Um, we have committed to a, a program that is varied and diverse, um, that has a number of different programs run at different times of the day. To consider that people um, are time poor and they may not have the same block of time in the middle of the day to um, participate in student life. So we are committed to of those programs for students to engage um, either through social media or through some of the online tools that support student life. Um, and I know we've also started doing a lot more stuff with our clubs and societies in terms of social media support. Um, so um, students can engage with those clubs and societies through social media and interact um, from a distance if they can't actually get onto campus. Thanks very much for that answer. Now that my microphone is back on. Um, I think we just have time for one more question and it is for Ava. And that is, why was the GDLP in law cut to so the Graduate Diploma of Legal Practice? Um, I have a very um, brief answer to that. Um, there were not sufficient student numbers and it was financially unsustainable. And there are many providers who are able to attract greater student numbers and make these programs more attract uh, uh, attractive uh, in, in terms of student experience, but also in, in financial terms. I think that's probably um, the right answer, but I I'm looking to Damien and others to see whether there's something else that I could add to that. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think that just about wraps up our Q&A UOW style. I'd like to thank everyone in the audience um, for coming along today, and especially thank you to our panel. Um, so we had uh, Vice Chancellor Paul Wellings. Applause, applause, please, thank you. <laughs> um, Eva Lenonen, Damien Israel, Melba Crouch, and uh, Megan Hoosman, and John Patterson at the end. Thank you very much to the panel. And uh, a big thank you to UOW Student Life for organising the event today. Thanks very much. <laughs>